So here we are then, Steve Clark. Nice to meet you, buddy. How you doing, mate? Oh, good. Good. Yeah, really good. Yeah, really so, good. Uh, we've tried to plan this for some time, haven't we? We have indeed. Finally got together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Super Sausage Cafe. Yeah. Never been here, so uh, yeah. fantastic place. It's an awesome place. Yeah. Really popular. Um, with all the bikers, uh, MTN. And now it's on the 250 route with a Tesla yeah. motorbikes as well. So yeah, I think most people have heard of the the uh, Super Sausage if they haven't been here. So and if they haven't, then obviously That's pay a know. visit. Yeah. So we've got some bad news this week. Yeah, a little thing I I'd like to touch on is um, well we know we just lost Caroline Flack um, a little while back last week with the uh, mental health issues. She took her own life. But sadly. Um, Found out yesterday morning, uh, one of my dear friends has just also done the same. Um, he's been struggling with his demons for a while. He's a biker friend of mine, an ex-colleague, Nick Waldup is his name. Um, absolutely fantastic guy, one of the best guys you could ever wish to meet, you know. So it's just basically, it's a bit hard to talk about really, but because it, it brings all my demons back as well again. And it's just one of them things that just, if you what Caroline Flack said was, in a world where you can be anything, be kind. I mean, those words resonate so true. Yeah. Simply because, to do exactly that, if you see someone struggling, we can all we can all give things and help people in certain ways, but the most precious thing you can ever give to anybody is your time, yeah? And yeah. a shoulder to cry on or listen to, a helping hand. The thing is, when it, you don't know how people have, what they do with it inside them. Exactly. And you'll find with a lot of people, it's, uh, it's the proverbial swan, isn't it? Yeah, I'm okay, and it, I'm looking good on top, but underneath I'm paddling like crazy. It's just the fault in the demons inside. It is, they? yeah. And if it's just a message really to say to anybody out there, talking from my own experience, I find my demons every day still now, you know? And I know what it's like to be on the cusp, and I'll leave it at that, but it's, if you see someone struggling, or it, it's just nice to ask, are you okay? And it's okay to be okay. You don't have to be great or well or anything. How dark must it be? Yeah, yeah. You know, that people be in a place like that. Yeah, but everybody, every day, everybody's got their own problems. Yeah. Nobody seems to care. But, um, and maybe we should care a bit more. You yeah, know? I think we should. And I think, especially with the biking community, that's what we do care, don't yeah. we? We always make the difference if we can. But let's extend that helping hand. So we're going to go back to the year 1957. Yeah. Now, there's a young United States Air Force officer named Albert Charles Edward Clark. I think I know him. <laughs> who is serving at the South Roslick military base here in Uxbridge. Yeah. So that name rings a bell? It certainly does. Okay then. A young lady named Phyllis Ruby Mary. <laughs> yeah. Yep. A young English girl. And funny enough, she happens to meet this United States Air Force officer. And they soon start to date. <laughs> yeah. Their relationship blossoms. And just after a year together, they decide to get married in 1958. Can I just add to that? You can indeed. When they started dating, my mum used to work at the Picture House yeah. in Uxbridge. And, uh, and she met my dad through one of her friends who was dating another um, USAF um, guy. And, uh, so it was a bit of, oh, I'll fix up with my mate. And then he used to all ride around on motorbikes. Yeah. I don't know what motorbikes they were. I think they're like Harley type bikes. And uh, my dad used to pick my mum up and uh, she used to have to wear a leather jacket. And, uh, and they had red crash helmets with white kind of crossbones on. So we jump to 1959. This sees the birth of their first child, Cheryl. My sister. Which is your eldest sister. Mm -hmm. But Albert's military service here in the UK is coming to an end. So the family moved back to the United States and they set up home. Yeah. Okay. The family then welcomed the birth of their second child, Robert. Yeah. Your was older in brother. Fort Worth, Texas then, I believe. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Then in December 1961, at Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas, the birth of their third child. A little brat. A cheeky little fella, <laughs> full of life, named Stephen Clark was born. That's and me. I wonder who that is. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, so we don't jump. So now you know where I get the Albie from. Which so is Albert after me dad. That's, that's what I was about to ask you that. Ah, sorry, that's Albert. Albert. Yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So Albert, that's yeah, where even Rick used to call you. If we were now out for a drink or anything, he didn't used to shout dad. He used to say, Albie, Albie, get the drinks in. He always pushed me at the front of the bar. You're bigger than me. You're going, no one's getting away. You're good. <laughs> so, 
Albie. Yes, the, the Albie for all of my sins. Yeah. Right, so we jumped to 1964. You're three years old, and unfortunately, your mother and father divorce, and your mother returns to the UK with the three children. Yeah. And you all remain here to this day. Yeah. I oh, know. I oh, know. My brother still. My brother lives in America still Does now. He? Yeah. So yeah. what was life like in the Clark household growing up? I don't remember an awful lot of it being such a top, but um, I know. <laughs> Dad was always the always the uh, the spoilt one, if you like, um, being the baby of the family, and uh, much to my brother and sister's dismay, many many arguments we had over the years. But, uh, but yeah, we all get our like, house on fire now. They're like typical siblings, always arguing things. Because uh, me being the spoilt little brat always got my own way. And, and to be honest, growing up, I was I was a little arsehole, To be honest, <laughs> for want of a better word. Sorry about that, but. Yeah, and it's only when you grow up and you get your own family you realise the value of yeah. things in life. I mean, I was a typical teenager and all the rest of it. Jack the lad, knew everything, couldn't be told anything. We had everything we wanted, you know, we always had food on our food on the table, clothes on our back, you know, toys to play with, all that kind of thing. But it, it wasn't always the best of times, you know, it was tough. Tough growing up sometimes. Um, we had a stepdad and everything else because um, mum had divorced and everything else. And, and dad, bless him, my stepdad, Mick, he's gone now, God rest his soul. But uh, so you could never want for a better provider in your life. But um, he, he wasn't very emotionally attached that yeah, way. Yeah. But, but as, a, as a provider and that, he was, you couldn't knock him. He never, ever, ever, I don't remember him ever having a day off work until, until he got sick with his heart. Do you have any relationship with your real father? I didn't touch. speak to Dad until my sister was getting married, and I was 16 at the time. So, and the first time I spoke to him was on a phone call, and uh, it was really strange, really surreal. And uh, it was this guy that was my dad. Do you think I was 18 months old when he left us? I bit... mean, you think nowadays it's easier because mm. someone's got a photo or a video, which yeah. you, know, you can hear somebody's voice. Obviously, well, back that's then, it. we didn't hear there was no, nothing. We didn't know nothing. No. So, and all of a sudden he'd come out of the blue and stuff. He used to write to us for about a yep. year or so before. So I think my mum got in touch with him to say that Cheryl was getting married. And uh, then they started, started a bit of communication, started and a bit of dialogue, and then he phoned us. And uh, yeah, it's really weird. And then when I met him for the first time, and I'm like, wow, this is my dad. And it's quite a strange feeling, yeah. you know. Cut a long story short, um, he didn't stay for very long, he stayed for the wedding and went back. We carried on the relationship. Yeah. I actually went out to see him, and uh, it was nice because when I when I when I met him, I started to get to know him a little bit. I spent a couple of weeks, no, a week, yeah, two weeks with him um, in America, in Arizona, where he was from. Started to get to know him, and then the bloody sort of up and died on me two years, uh, a year later. So, uh, I bought some stuff for me today to show you some of, some of the old stuff, the newspaper clippings of Dad, some old pictures of my heritage. Because I really want to know more about my heritage. Because yeah. we come from Indian descent. Um, on my on my Dad's side, his mum, uh, his my 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 great nan, she was Cherokee. Oh, and, uh, so they all come from that descent, you know, the, the Trail of Tears and that kind of stuff. So, and uh, my Dad was um, from Oklahoma. My, Sorry, my granddad was from Oklahoma. So yeah, so there's a lot of history from that. I've got some pictures of some of my old aunts and that. And you can clearly see that um, the, the Indian heritage. It could be a bit of a trail there, you could. Yeah, you could well, we've gone back so go far. Um, but we had, my sister did a lot of it. We haven't managed to get much further at the minute. But, um, we, we, I was born in Texas, but we were raised in Virginia. So in Portsmouth in Virginia. And uh, my granddad uh, used to be, used to work on the ferries and that there as well. So I've even got a picture of the ship. Because my dad obviously did two tours of um, Korea as well. Yeah. And uh, so I've got a picture of uh, the boat that he actually went out there on as well. So yeah. So uh, all, it? all interesting stuff. Yeah. So as yeah. I said for you now, there could be hundreds of clocks out there. Yeah, probably. It's a quite a common name. A bit like Smith and a Jones. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Common as muck. <laughs> Just without the accent now. <laughs> My dad when he was younger. That's him. Wow. Yeah. So we got there he is in his uniform with with my uh, my my nan and my granddad, his mum and dad, my two aunties, um, um Bet and uh, Betty and Francis. In the Air Force. He was just a, just a US Airman. Yeah, yeah that's, that's Bet and Francis. Um, one of them is no longer with us now, unfortunately. And that was me, Granny, if you like. 
with a couple more of Dad in his uniform and him when he was a kid. And this is him when he was even younger, look. so yeah. When he was even smaller, and that's wow. when he first started in the cadets. So, these are a couple of my old aunts. Well, that's one of my old aunts. So you can see the Indian the there. Away. And this was my great grandma. So, so, you can see that. So, how far back would that be going? That would be going to the early 1900s. Wow. Yeah. A couple of interesting bits here. It is. These are my Mexican half brothers. You have a look at these. Proper gringos. Wow. Look at them. It's like somebody said to Sons of Anarchy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like mafia, isn't it? <laughs> Mexican mafia. So these are in Arizona somewhere, I believe. So I've never met them. I don't even know their names, but uh, but like I said, Dad used to get about. I wonder if they they know of you. I don't know. I would have not a clue. There's there's Dad. When just be able to take just before he died, the year he died, yeah. So, so he's got the old steps on on still. Yeah, he's got the uh, the old Indians. You can see, yeah, yeah. you can see the heritage. Yeah, if you look in my office when you do see my videos and stuff, yeah. I've got all the Indian heritage on. Ah, where it all come from? And that was that was Nan. That was Dad's mum, Minnie. So again, you can see the Indians. Yeah. So. You can you can you can see kind how it's filtered down. Yes, you can. You can see yeah, it's, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and that's the ship he went out in when he went over. When he went over. Wow. So we've got a little message on the top there. You can read it at the bottom when it was going over. Fifth of May, nineteen fifty-four. So if you kind of look at them in chronological order, this was me a few days old. There it is, there's Albie. <laughs> when I was young and innocent. <laughs> uh, and this is a bit of us, me and my brother and sister. Me so that, that's the three of you, yeah. Grow, that was in America, growing up in the States and stuff. But yeah. Obviously, I bet you can have no memories of this, are you? No. Because you was, what, three when you left? I was just under three. Came back just before my, birth, before my third birthday, yeah. And this is when I had long hair like you. Look at this. Yeah. When I first moved to Milton Keynes, 1974. I think I was 12. I was a bit of a rebel at 12. <laughs> my mum kept saying, get a haircut. No, I don't want it cut. You'd have to get a wig one day and <laughs> yeah, get back yeah. to it. My first bike legally on the road when I was 16 years old. An old Suzuki I bought for 50 quid. And, uh, it's amazing how even back then, we all know where to stick a photo of our bike. Yes. The helmet's perfectly in place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, my uncle taught me how to ride on a little pooch maxi in an alleyway at the back of his house. And then uh, that was one of my first ones. That was my first ever legal bike when I was 16 on the road. I've had a couple on the C50. So then, that? at this point, had you got an interest in bikes or was yes. it just a transport? No, I, I actually loved bikes and yep. I always wanted a bike. As soon as I was 16, bang, I got one. Straight away. And I know you should use it for transport yep. for work and stuff. Yeah, because when I was 16, I left school, started work straight away. This was when I bought my first ever brand new bike, a Yamaha DT175. I had the DT50 was my Did first you? bike, yep. That was a 175. I remember I bought that. And my dad, that was when my dad came over for my sister's wedding and he actually bought me my gloves for my birthday present. Ah. Yeah, he paid for my gloves. Okay then. This was my, probably my first, other than that, I yep. mean obviously when, when the kids were born I gave up biking yep. for a while. And then when I decided to start, I think it was about 2001, I decided to get back into it again when I had a bit more money. God, you can obviously see Ricky. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that was uh, CBR 600, my first one. And uh, I love that bike, it was a really good bike. And that was the first good one. Good looking bikes, aren't they? Yeah. Good looking bikes. And I used to love the tri colour yeah. as well. And I, then I went on to, we did two tours of Europe on that. The first one we just went to France, and the second time we went to France, um, Italy, and Switzerland. Yeah, wow. really good. Yeah. That's when I, again, that would have gone. Then I, when I got this one a few years later, I got a little Suzuki 200 to get back yeah. into it for transport for work. And the reason I bought that is because I had a car when Lee passed his test at 17. I sold, I parked my car to buy him a car. And I thought, what am I going to do for work now? He's doing push bike, I'm fed up with it. Yeah. So when I bought myself and have a little run around. But this is when I bought my second uh, oh, CBR6. Boy, so yeah. This one's different. This one's a few years later. And uh, I absolutely, I wish I'd never ever parked with this yeah. bike. 
It had everything. It had the hugger, it had the, it had the seat cow, it had the heated grips, it, it was fantastic. And it was it was like brand spanking new. When I actually sold it, the guy said to me, I feel guilty taking it off you for this price. And he said, it's in such mint condition. I said, yeah, but I need the money. So, so this week you can see, I've got the old tri-colour yeah. lens. I've still got them lens in my loft. Don't ask me if they fit or not. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, I was a bit slimmer then. But, uh, yeah. It's a nice set up, I did, I said, with the... Yeah. With the colour scheme, yeah, and the smoke screen, screen and lovely set up. Yeah. The stars and, see all the old stars and stripes. Yeah. And so, and the next one, I'll tell you when you get there, you'll see. See what you notice on there about the filming. In the old days, I could see it. You've got a camcorder. <laughs> In the old days, you used to you see the camcorder to the bag. What Didn't have none of these drifts and GoPros and stuff. <laughs> I just pray like crazy that it don't fall off. <laughs> that was a lot of money in them days. Have you still got the footage from that? Yes, I have. Yeah. Wow. I've still got the footage from it, yeah. That's when we went through Mont, Mont Blanc Tunnel. That was a good good experience. And that was up in So what year is this? This would have been 2003. Yeah. We did the first tour in 2001 and we went back two years later. So at this point, there was no Brexit, was there? <laughs> Absolutely not. No. Things were a lot easier then. A couple of the old uh, wedding shots. Not the people there you see him. The smooth man himself. <laughs> There's Pablo. Look when he had air. <laughs> so this is the Pablo. What's got a problem yeah. understanding Brummies? Yes, that's right. It. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I will find him a translator for his phone. He'll appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, so we yeah. can understand it. <laughs> that's my sister. And that was two days after her 17th birthday. Wow. Mad, isn't it? And I had to get a special license. But that's what you did, though, didn't you? Then yeah, is it, you got a house, work, yeah. you started a family. She is my beautiful bride, seventeen. <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? When you think yeah. back, if my kids had ever come to me at seventeen or eighteen, yeah. said I'm getting married, I'd say, I mean, nowadays, about Willis, I know? can't see my kids affording a house by the time I'm thirty. No, well, Rick was twenty-six yeah. when we left home. Yeah. You know, it's just crazy. Well, it is, isn't it? When you think then, like seventeen, you're a man. You want, yeah. you're about to fight the world. That's it. You yeah. want your own two feet. Yeah. In them days, you just got on with it, didn't yeah. you? You just wanted to get and start a family and track wow. it's, uh, Yeah. <laughs> you asked me about when Ricky's um, first interest in motorbikes. So this is Ricky's first interest in bikes? Probably even before that, yeah, because I'd always had bikes. He'd always come out and sit on them and stuff like that, and he absolutely adored them. So, how old would he be there? There, I think he was, I think he was about three there. Yeah. Got his jelly beans on? I remember the jelly yeah. beans. Yeah. Yeah, he absolutely loved anything that went fast I'll tell you and what, moved. He's got a good race position there, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah. he's, got his, he's got his head well tucked in. Yeah. He absolutely adored his bikes. That's him on his uh, Yamaha 100 when he, when he kind of uh, upgraded a little bit when he was old enough to ride. That was his first bike. We, I taught him to ride a dirt bike before that. And uh, I don't know if um, I've got actually still on video. Um, I called it Dirt Bike Kings. A little video of him first learning to ride our, our dirt bike. So I bought myself a little uh, scrambler to go over the fields with. And, uh, and he loved it. So, <laughs> He's calling him DJ Turbo then. So. <laughs> I could see uh, the CBR. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, in the back. What have you got there? Oh, that was yeah. his first bike. Now, that's the story for, for when Lee was... So this was Ricky's? That's Ricky's actual bike, yeah. yeah. When Lee was 18, because 18 months between them, yeah. Lee's the oldest, um, we bought him a laptop for his 18th birthday. It cost us 1,500 quid. My laptop's quite new then, and uh, back in the year, and because uh, that's what he was into, going yeah. to college, going to uni, and the rest of it. But Rick, now nah. I said, "What do you want, Rick?" I said, "I'll have a bike, please, Dad." So, and uh, yeah, that was eighteen hundred quid, so I had to put the extra to it for him because he didn't have it at that age. <laughs> but it was a lovely bike. Isn't it? So it looks it, yeah. it used to have slightly overrun. And uh, when you shut the throttle off, a bit like my one, bang yeah, bang. Yeah. But the flames used to come out the exhaust. And at night time, it looked really tricky. He loved it's it. It's even got the polished on the rim, hasn't it? Yeah. The polished rim. He absolutely adored that bike. Yeah. But it's funny enough because he did all that. He did his, did his, um, all oh, his bike training, passed his test. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but he never ever sent his license away. He never ever sent his certificate away to get the for the foot for the um, two years on the CBT. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So and that expired. Of course, when it expired, he gave up bikes completely. So after that, he didn't ride for years. Right. And all of a sudden, he thought, oh, he got the bug again, like yeah. you do, being a biker. It's a nice looking bike. Yeah, it? it was a lovely machine. Yeah. And that's when he went out and he bought the. Um, after that, when he went back to biking, he went and bought the. What was it? He bought the Thunder Cat. Yeah. Yeah, the Thunder Cat. Yeah. And the they 600. Did a silver and yellow. This was like a blue one. I yeah. Think. Yeah, blue one. Blue and silver. 600 Thunder Cat. And then he went from that to the 600 Gixxer. Yeah. So was this of this bike? Yes, it was. And if yeah. you look closely, them levers look a bit big for him, didn't they? <laughs> they were his mum's levers. Because <laughs> Ellen used to ride on the back of me. We've still got all their gear up in the loft to this day. Yeah. At least you have the proper gear on, though. Yeah, always. I taught him how to ride. I made sure when I was just taking up the car park, I made him ride with me on the back so he could handle it properly and everything else. So, how old was he? Uh, he'd have been about 23, around about then. Yeah. But like I say, after that, he gave up. Yeah. And then it was years later, he decided Which we all to... seem to do, don't know a lot of people. We seem yeah. to have a gap. I think, as he said, it is. Yeah. And then he decided to pick up again, and that's when he went to the Thundercat, then he went to the to the Gix of 600, then the Gix of 1000. Yeah. So, he was all about, he loved it, it power command about going fast and everything else, and uh, just don't tell your mother. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was a good rider, he was a safe rider, but, but he did like his speed. So, but, and we all go through that phase, don't we? Yeah. So now we want to talk about Ricky. Mm. So, Ricky's got two lads himself. Yeah, two little lads. Yeah, yeah. Oscar and Ollie, Oliver. And they, yeah. Have they got Ricky's traits? Have they got the, the youngest, youngest one? Personally? Absolutely, Oscar. The youngest one. He's like a spit out of his gob, as they say. So when you look at him and everything he does, he's all, Rick was. I mean, the pair of them, Lee and Rick, yep. they were both little monkeys and they were both absolutely good boys. You could take them anywhere. They were so good and they were so close. Only 18 months between them, you can imagine. They were like best mates as well as brothers. Plus um, the feed off each other, didn't oh, they? Oh, and, and, and the two of them together. I mean, they're both funny in their own yeah. right, but the two of them together, it's, it just had in fits the whole day long, all the time. But Rick was, Rick was I mean, even Lee is now, he, when he's on his own, Lee's kind of, he's very quiet to a degree and, uh, and he, he doesn't show his emotions that yeah. much so he won't tell you he loves you and all yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of thing he, he, he shows it in other ways rather than telling you um, but when he does tell you it means a yeah. lot you know like he told me on my birthday two years back he said I love you dad and that made me cry because he never says it you know um, so yeah so that, that, that was good but, but, and he's funny he's a funny lad but Ricky is like he's like the life and soul of the party if you like if he walked in a room it, it, it would just light up and, and he'd always make someone laugh he's such a joker he's like yeah. oh yeah he ball sack what are you up so to he was the, oh yeah the, he's the big character oh, yeah yeah he wasn't cocky or full yeah. of himself he was just funny you know and he, if anybody was sad he'd give him a cuddle yeah. and up, you know, if I was upset and he'd always make you laugh he was pulling faces the whole time and uh, yeah so he was a uh, he was a right character. Yeah. So, so Lee, Lee never had any interest in the bikes? No, he, well he always liked them, but yeah. Rick had more sort of, kind of confidence, I think, going forward yeah. in that respect. Lee was more the academic, yeah. and, um, and Rick was more the, the, the hands-on. Yeah, approach, the, yeah, right? yeah. yeah the doer. But um, yeah, I mean, Lee, Lee's fantastic. He could, we always used to say he could, he could build a rocket ship and fly it to the moon, but he didn't have an ounce of common sense. Whereas Rick was the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Rick, couldn't, Rick couldn't put two and two together, but he could but he he get had, there, but so straight street yeah. You know, he had he had that he had that kind of savviness about him all the time. I always taught my kids never to be something you're not, or pretend to be something you're not. You know, be what you are and enjoy your life. Yeah. And Rick had that philosophy. He always like, I oh, don't don't leave it till tomorrow, Dad. Do it today. You know, you might not be here tomorrow. You know, and he was always he, he took life by the yawns and he, and he lived his life. Yeah. So he was yeah he was always out there doing it. You know. You know. And I think that's that's what kind of hurt the most, you know, yeah. when, when we lost him because yeah. it's that way of thought, and it? it's it's the hole it leaves because yeah. his character is so big, you yeah. know, and it leaves that hole in your life. Yeah. It's like life doesn't seem as much fun anymore. Yeah. You know, does that make sense? And uh, I mean, he's like the best mate. When it's, and when it's something, you know, I look to myself. It's something I, I can't even comprehend what that was. When, when Lee went to 
went to uni. Uh, me and the missus had a few problems then, uh, 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 like all couples do, going through that long, living together a long time. And uh, we weren't vibing, as they say, and it, and it kind of got, it just became me and Rick. Uh, we, we turned to each other and we had each other. Um, and we just, this bond just formed and it was incredible. It, 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 I mean, I've got that with Lee as well, which is great. So, I've always been like their, their mate as well as their dad, because it's such, it's such a young yeah, age Yeah, that's an important thing, and it is. Absolutely. Instead of just being just the authoritative figure in the life. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I remember Lee coming to me once, we had a few problems in his life, he said to me, Dad, he said, why are you always right? Why do you always know the answers? Said, because I've made the mistakes so that you don't that's have good. to, you know? That's why you get the grey yeah. hair, isn't it? And they, and they have to realise that. Yes. And I think as they get older, they, I think all of us do, we yeah. realise what's important in life, the values of life. Yeah. It's not having the fancy car or the nice house, it's yeah. about the people you love and the people yeah. around you, that's what matters. And it's the little things that make you feel happy. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. When you kiss your kid and, yeah. and read them a story at night time, yeah. they can turn around and say, Daddy, I love you. And that's what matters. And that's what I really miss the most, because Rick was, he was a total opposite. You're going to text me now, aren't you? <laughs> he was a total opposite because he would tell me he loved me all the time. So I said, he's choking me. He, 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 he would always tell me, and he'd, he'd throw his hands, arms around me and kiss me and stuff. So come on, man, we're going to go and do this or whatever. And it's hard when you lose that to get to know. And, uh, I suppose you're still exposed. You, you want that so much that. again. You know what I mean? You want <laughs> it so saying, much again. Yeah, but, it's like calling but you But you're not going to have it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's what, because, because he was such an influence in everyone's life, I think that's what everybody misses. Uh, yeah, everybody's felt, you know? yeah. Everybody's because it's finished. always there and all of a sudden it's gone, you know? And you look for it in other places but to try and find it and you can't. You can't, you can't. You can't no. it, so, uh, uh, yeah, me and, me and, I mean, it's not just, I mean, I miss him in my way, obviously. His mum does. Yeah. I don't know what it's like to carry a child for nine months yeah. and all the rest of it. So she misses him and her away. And they were really close when they were kids, when he was a baby. I had kind of like the latter half of, of being closer to him, yeah. you know, even though the we were close. Side. Yeah, <laughs> as, 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 I mean, we'd go out drinking, we'd go out clubbing, we'd go out football, shooting, motorbikes, you name it, everything. Um, whatever he did, I had to do with him. Like airsoft, all sorts of stuff. Because uh, if he had a hobby, I had to do it with him. Yeah. So, That's a bit like what Trent, the little ones like with me. <laughs> yeah. If he's doing something, you've got to do it yeah, with him. Yeah, but I've always shown interest, like Lee, he's flying and his computers yeah. and everything he's done. I've always done the same with him as well. We've got a magical bond, you know. And it's, it's great to have that with your kids, yes. you know, because you're only here once and then you chill. Some parents don't have that bond, do they? They don't. Some parents they ain't bothered about that bond. No, and I, and I don't understand like when these people, they just they obviously have their own reasons and stuff, but when they leave their kids and stuff and they never see them again. But it can't be asked. My kids, to this day, have always been the most important thing in my life. I always used to say to my missus, and we had the same agreement, I said, if you and the boys are hanging over a cliff, I'm saving them before I save you. Yeah. Always. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like that with my grandkids yeah. now. So protective over my grandkids. I've got four beautiful grandsons. And they idolise me. And 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 that's and I think you only get back what you put in, you know? Yeah. I mean that's what I love. I live for my family, you know. I don't get me wrong, I love my friends and everybody else. And I've got a big heart and I try to share as much as I can, you know. But the most important thing to me in my life is, is my family. And it always will be, you know. And even though Rick's gone if you like, he's, he's still here. He'll never go away. Yeah. I'll speak to him every single day. First person I'll speak to in the morning, last person I'll speak to at night. And everything I do, I ask for his guidance. I talk to him, I ask for his help, whatever. And, uh, and that's nice. But I know his brother. And it's hard because Lee won't show his emotions. I know he misses him terribly. He misses him as much as I do easily in his way as a yeah. brother. I remember when he passed his he passed his test for his flying, got his license. Killed me when he did it and he went straight to the grave, Rick's grave. And Rick was the first person he told. And then he rung me from the from the graveyard to tell me he was there telling Rick. And he, and he, and he says the reason he flies is because when he's up there he feels closer to him. And that's why I said both of my both of my boys have got their wings now. So <laughs> sorry. You sorted both of us now, yeah. I oh, know. <laughs>
that day was, I spoke to him. So we, what were we in, November? In November, yeah. So if you say Saturday, the, the day before, Saturday the 15th of November, uh, 2014, he was, he rang me up, I was texting me. We used to speak to each other every single day. Yeah. He'd ring me up from work, I'm bored, or he'd send me a picture of a bird's arse in a petrol station, that kind of thing, <laughs> saying, cool, look at that, <laughs> anything. Or he'd, on one time he rang me up and said, he was fuming, I said, what's the matter? He said, I need to talk to you. He said, this bloke's just, I've just come in to do this job, this bloke's just giving me a mouth of abuse for nothing. He said, I want to rip his head off. He said, I knew if I talked to you, you'd calm me down. So, he said, because you're always the voice of reason. So I calmed him down. So I used to speak to him every day. Two, three times a day, I said, Rick, I'm trying to work. Piss off, leave me alone. <laughs> all the time. He never, because he was always out in the car doing jobs all the time. And, uh, yeah, so I spoke to him on the Saturday. He was working. And he said, tomorrow I'm going out. Uh, me and Jamie, we're going to go out and do a, we're going to go over to a down tree, over to a bike shop, just for a little last ride. So we should be putting that bike away now, because the weather's getting bad. It's been a bit of a crappy weekend. And uh, he said, will you come with me? I was working on the Saturday on the dot com. I said, no, no, I'm working. And tomorrow I've got a load of paperwork to do anyway, so I can't. I've got to catch up on all my paperwork. I said, but you're coming to dinner, right? Because every Sunday is a family day in my house. So the kids always come yeah. out for dinner and stuff. He said, yeah, 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 come out for dinner. So next day, it rolls on to Sunday, I'm upstairs, sending me pyjamas, missus in her dressing gown, doing all the housework. Just finished all my paperwork, one o'clock, um, the phone rings. So, ah, oh, that'd be Rick now, great time, I've just finished all what I need to do. And uh, she was going to the bike shop this morning. So it was, um, it was his father in He said, Steve, I need you to sit down, I've got, I've got some, some bad neck. Was the father-in-law with them at the time? No, he was no. at home, but he got the call. You know, so. um, he said, the kid's had an accident, he's come off his bike. Oh, shit. Uh, I said, ah, oh. the first thing you think of is, Christ, he's going to go nuts if he's busted that bike. He loves that bike, he lives for his bike. And, uh, and that's what I said to him, I said, oh, for God's sake, he's going to go nuts. I said, oh. He said, it's worse than that. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, all I know at the moment is the air ambulance has been called. You know that it's serious. The first thing I thought of was, how am I going to tell his mum? So she was still, obviously, in pyjamas. So you still don't know anything at this point? Nothing, absolutely nothing. I'll just not know. I've got Jamie's number, his mate, and I'm ringing it, and I'm ringing it, and I'm ringing it, and I'm ringing it. And I'm ringing it. No answer, no answer, no answer. So I said to Ellen, look, I said, don't panic, calm down, don't panic. I said, but Rick's come off his bike. Oh, no, you're not mum's alike. Yeah. I said, look, all we know at the minute is the air ambulance has been called, I'm not going to lie to you. So you can imagine, we had to get all the way over to Northampton. Um, my son had been informed before us, Lee, and uh, so we literally threw some clothes on, got over there. So where, we, where was your heading? Was you going to? We was going straight to their house in Northampton. To that like Teresa, yeah. Yeah, where he was living, his mother and father was. And uh, so it's a good 20 minute, 25 minute journey. So all the time we're out on the way, yeah. she's ringing, ringing, ringing Check while it. I'm driving. No answer. He gets there, he pulls into the street. It's a cop car in the street. My oh, I fell apart there. It just, it's like it was yesterday. You never forget it. Worst day of my life. I knew then it was bad news. I don't send a cop Did car. Did you know from here. seeing that sign? And I said to Ellen, that, that's not good. She said, don't say that, don't say that. She said, let's be positive. So we were. So. We walked into the house. My son Lee just gave gave Ellen the cuddle straight away. She just fell on the floor screaming. And it was just literally my whole world just fell apart. We don't know what to do. What can we do? And it made it worse because they wouldn't let us go and see him. Because he had to be held in the mortuary and stuff. And uh, that was the hardest part. I mean, do you know, well, we did told. you lose him at the accident? Or yeah. yeah. So he didn't even make it to the hospital? No. no. They worked on him for 
best part of an hour at the scene. Jesus. But um, there was three cars that, that we found out at the inquest. There was three cars behind, and uh, the second one was a paramedic uh, going to work. And, he, and we went round to see these people afterwards and to thank them and all the rest of everything they'd done sometime after. And um, he said to me, Steve, he said, he was gone by the time I got to him. It was instant, absolutely instant. He said, so I know it's bad, he said, but at least if you can take some solace, take it from that. What happened was, he'd been down this road a hundred times before. It was a wind, a windy road, and it's over the crest of a hill, but it turns to the left on the crest and it's a reverse camber as well. Right, okay. It was damp, yeah. because we'd had a real bad foggy morning, but the fog had cleared. But it wasn't wet, it was damp. And uh, somehow, we don't know how, but, because the car behind didn't see it. Because he'd gone over the hill, and then the car behind, when he came over, he see the bike just going. The bike had went, and there was a big score in the road where the peg had dug in. It went down, but it high-sided him, flipped him off. And there's a curve about this big, and he hit his head on that curve, and it snapped his neck instantly, and it uh, it literally killed him instantly. And then, uh, then he rolled about because all we knew at the time there were trees involved, so he hit a load of trees and stuff. And uh, we found out later on from the inquest he had punctured lungs and broken ribs and all that kind of stuff. But, and he ended up in the ditch. And his mate came back. His mate didn't even know where he was. He worked. He was there one minute. He worked the next. So he come back. And see him there, but I said to James, I said, what? What? Why didn't you answer your phone? He said, Steve, what could I have said to him? He said, what could I have said? And I said, it's no. It's not the call he wants to answer, is it? Exactly. <laughs> so he said, I don't know what to say or what to do. And uh, they were really good friends. It messed him up big time, his mate. Because I suppose you kind of get survivor's guilt or whatever whatever it is they have, you know, yeah. that sense of responsibility, you know. But, um, yeah, it wasn't good. Uh, so it was instant. It was instant. It was an instant. That's the only the only solace I take is because if I'd have known that he was there suffering, that would have killed me. Absolutely killed me. The thing is, I was supposed to be with him that day because he wanted me to go. Now again, they say things happen for a reason. Could you imagine if I was behind him and I saw that happen? I was there. I mean, part of me he wanted to be, and still to this day does, so I could understand it more. Yeah. And for, for, for weeks after, well, you've, you've lost enough as it is. But I think that would have probably put me in a mental yeah. line. You know? um, for weeks afterwards, every time I shut my eyes, because I've been down that road a hundred times as well, I could see myself riding and I got to the hill and then it went. It was just like I'm watching a video and then psh, it goes black. So I don't see the final bit happen. And I tried so hard, I even got on my bike and I went down that road, delivering it as hard as I could. Until to a point where it would be dangerous for me. Um, and I got up to like 80, 90 mile an hour going over that crest, and that was getting dangerous. Thinking, I need to find out what happened. But everybody said he wasn't going that fast. Was it something that scared him? What, what made him lose it? We did actually find out at the inquest that his tyres were on the wrong way, the direction that rotation. When they'd service his bike, they put new tyres on, but they put them on the wrong way around. So his pattern. Yeah, it was Stop doing the opposite. When he went to, a couple of weeks before the accident, he went to Donington with Jamie, and he said to me, Dad, he said, it was the scariest ride home I've ever had. He was pissing down. He said, no, I was aquaplaning nearly all the way home. He said, I just could not get any traction on my wheels. Jesus Christ. And he didn't know. And, uh, but they, the inquest, ruled out inconclusive because um, they had no concrete evidence that it would have made that much difference in the damp. Had it been raining, yes, then the tyre company or the garage, the garage that did it would have been liable. So I did hear that they sacked the fitter. But, um, Problem is though, it is. But the tyre's got to tread for the reason, but you look the direction. For, but you look for someone to blame, <clears throat> you know? I spent ages on my Lisa to me, Dad, stop doing it. He said, because you're asking questions you'll never know the answer to. He said, all that's going to do is ruin your life. And he, he, was, he was going through so much as well. But he became the dad, if you like. He was mine and Helen's rock. All he was going through, and he he, he stepped up and looked after That's something, something you, like from then to now, uh, how'd, you, how'd you get up each day? Um, For the first three weeks, if I got out of bed and brushed my teeth, I was lucky. That was a good day. That was a good day. 
And then, of course, everybody comes out of the woodwork to, to offer their condolences. And it just gets too much to handle sometimes. You know? It helps to talk. Obviously, like I said, you can't. And I, I came so close so many times to just ending it. Because I just couldn't see a way out. But it's, it's like you're trapped in a dark room. You don't know where the door is. And you know you're going to be there for the rest of your life. What do you do? Take the easy way out, don't you? Because we had a few complications, which I won't discuss about on camera. Which made the grieving process a lot harder. Um, for kind of legal reasons, I won't discuss that. Um, those that are close to me know. But, um, You're disclosing enough just talking about this, Steve. Well, it's... I said to him, that's it, I can't, I can't take it no more. And he said, he got my grandson, Max. He said to me, all right, Dad. Go and do it. He said, but before you do it, tell him where you're going and what you're going to do. He said, you're not going to be here for him anymore. He said, because that kid loves you more than he loves me. And that, that was kind of a wake-up call for me. And then we spent the next, believe it or not, best part of an hour, crying in each other's arms. And uh, you can imagine the friction it caused between me and Ellen as well. She's grieving, I'm grieving, I can't be there for her because what I'm going through, she can't do that for me. It's hard. It's I suppose you can't support each other because you don't know how to. You don't know how to. You don't, she doesn't know what I'm feeling. I don't know yeah. what she's feeling because it's, it's different. It's the same, but it's different. Does that make and the problem is, you can't take each other's pain away, can you? No, you can't. Because you've both got the same one. Like I say, she doesn't know what it's like to lose your best friend, and I don't know what it's like to carry a child. You know? It's, it's the weirdest thing because that's what happened when, just like I said before, when we just developed that bond. When I mean, I've still got that bond with Lee. We've always had it. The whole family is so tight. And uh, we'd literally step in front of the train for each other. God never hurt one of my family because you'd be in a world of hurt, you know what I mean? But that's how family should be, you know? You'd, you'd get to support each other. But it's, and when you lose that, it's like, what do you do? How do, how do I carry on? And the rest of the world just goes to normal and carries on. And you think, but I say to Helen, all right, we've well, been unlucky, yeah? But we've also been lucky ourselves because you've got to look at it. We had him for 31 years, yeah? And he's left us so many memories and so much love and joy in our life. You can't take that away. No one can take that away. Never. And some people don't get that. Some people don't have that bond to begin with to lose. Some people lose their kids in more tragic circumstances, but they don't even have, a, have anything left of them and things like that. So you've got to think yourself lucky, you know? So yeah, you have to, nobody can take your memories away from you. No. Nobody can take them. And I've always been a kind of glass half full kind of guy rather than a glass empty, always. I've always been the optimist. And Rick was the same. And it was like, you know, yeah, it's bad. And it's, life's tough. But it has to go on. I have to be there for my grandkids now. I have to be there. I made a promise to Ricky on his deathbed that I would be there and look after his kids for the rest of their life, yeah. and I will. And we have, a, we have an annual tournament once a year. Um, Lobster Boy Golf, Golf Memorial. Lobster Boy. Lobster Boy Golf so what, Memorial. I've got the shirt on today. <laughs> What's with the lobster boy? The lobster. Here's the motif. Okay. Yeah, the lobster. Oh, I've actually got that tattoo on my leg as well. Okay. And uh, we called him Lobster Boy because he, he was fair. Every time he caught the sun, he would go like a lobster. He would go brown, he'd go bright red like a lobster. That's where the Lobster Boy come from. I, I think I've seen one of your pictures of with you and he's bright red in the face. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we had that and the money we raised from that every year, we put in a trust fund for the boys when they're older, in case they want to go to college or uni or anything like that, give them a start in life. So that's growing nicely each year. Do the boys, do they know? No, they don't know about it. But, um, but that'll be there for us as our gift to them from their dad and, and all the family, if you like, to, to help them start in life when they get bigger. So it's always, you've got to take the positives out, you know, the same as this with the blood bites. Yeah. Do you know the hardest thing of all? As a dad, you probably know this, you always there to protect your children, don't you? Now, when I went to visit him in the hospital, we weren't allowed to see him until the next day. All his little ears were now bruised. And that, I held his ears, and the hardest part is, you can't take that pain away or take that away, you know? And I kind of felt like a failure. And I blamed myself, and I thought, well, maybe if I'd have been there, it wouldn't have happened. Maybe if I'd have been there, you'd have been going slower. Maybe if I'd have been there, all these things you ask your questions all the time. 
but you can never find the answers, you know. But it was it a good was it a good thing I wasn't there? Or was it a bad thing I wasn't there? You just don't know. And these are the things that get you the most, you know, because it's something. And we have bad days. We have a lot of bad days. I suppose you didn't suppose you've got questions. Nobody can give you the answer for it. No, I'll get the answers one day and I'll kick his ass when I see him. When I, when I meet him at the gate for leaving. Because Bonfire night, November the fifth, they always used to come round uh, and Halloween. Because we used to me and Mick used to dress up and scare the kids down the street and stuff like that. And uh, I've seen pictures. <laughs> yeah, I've seen pictures as well. One day dressed up. Funny story I'll tell you quick. We were sitting outside, I was like sitting on a bench, like a mannequin, and he was in a clown suit with a big sword thing, standing at the standing at the door. Again like a mannequin. And this girl come up, are they real? Are they real? Are they real? And all of a sudden he went, chase chased this girl down the street. She literally peed her pants, <laughs> literally. <laughs> she was running down the road. It was so funny. But, um, yeah, but we saw him um, the week before. And, he, and we, I took him out. I just fitted, I don't know if you've seen it on my, on my VFR. I've got a little LED light bar underneath the nose. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, oh, Rick, come on, look what I've done to the bike and blah, blah, blah. And I said to him, and he's telling me that he's quiet, and I said, listen, just be careful out there. He said, Dad, you know I will. He said, I ain't going anywhere. He said, I love you, you know that. I mean, you know I'm a good rider. I said, yeah. And, and he gave me a big kiss and a cuddle, and that was the last time I ever seen him. And for months and months, I used to go into my garage and just sit there for hours, because that's the place I felt closest to him, out in the garage, because that's where we always were. Talking about bikes. And what happened to bikes. His, his, was his bike completely Yeah, it's completely wrecked. wrecked. Yeah, yeah, we didn't get anything. Well, I, I suppose that was taken anyhow. I suppose the inquiry wasn't it, was it? Say again? But did the police take the bike yeah, for the inquiry? And, yeah. well, we, went to, we went to the crash site, and um, I managed to salvage a couple of little bits that they'd left behind. And I, I've got one of the, the little light that goes in the front, I've kept that. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I kind of hate the bike for taking him away from me, but, but it wasn't the bike's fault. So you've got to be realistic, haven't you? But then, uh, for the worst of it is, we never, we never had anything to remind him of. Yeah, yeah. Nothing. I've got a lock of his hair, which I keep in my, I keep it in a safe place at home. And, uh, and that is the most precious thing to me in my whole life. A lock of hair. Yeah, yeah. It's worth more to me than anything. So. Because it's, and every now and again I'll take it, I'll give it a little kiss or something, you know, just to tell him I love him and that. But, but yeah, it's, it's tough. So that's, that's why this love bike thing is so important. It's, it was his dream, and I promised, made him a lot of promises, and I'll, I'll, I'll never break those promises, you know. And it's only because of people like yourself, Richie, all the wild batters, everybody out there, everybody that's helped donate and everything else. It's going to make that dream come true, and that's going to just be the most emotional day. And, uh, and I've always said, well, we'll do it this year. Oh yeah, You're this year, yeah, year. I hope so. It's been a year. And I always said that the day that it comes when I've actually got the bike in my garage and I'm on duty on it, that'll be unbelievable, won't it? But so uh, yeah, but I, I just can't thank anybody enough. I mean, every day is a struggle, even now. Some days you get up and you think, and you try and find things to do and and and, and, and places to. I don't know what's oh, what, I suppose, obviously with the Ricky's last ride and that, it's a permanent reminder, isn't it? I gave up riding and everyone said to me, please don't ride no more, Steve, don't do this. Don't. My yeah. missus never said a word. She said, Steve, you do what you need to do, right? She said, I know you'll, you'll work it out. She's been an absolute rock, my missus. And, um, I don't know, but I, I, in them days, I don't know why, but I used to come home from work, have a nice hot bath after decorating all day, yeah. and I used to put the iPad on by the chaps and sit and watch YouTube videos yeah. <laughs> with a beer, yeah. yeah? And I'd come across this motorbike in tours, Croatia or whatever yeah. it was, and I know, who's this guy, Richie V, and blah, 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 blah. And eventually, I, I drummed up enough courage, to, 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 it took me months to do it, to, to write him and say, and tell him about Ricky and what had happened. I had an email a few days ago from someone who um, quite recently lost his son in a motorbike accident 
he basically just wanted to reach out and say how much he's enjoying the videos and how much it helps him by watching them he's feeling like he's out on the road with us so obviously after something like that happens he was feeling like himself that he wanted to hang up his leathers his son um, his son lived for for his motorbike Steve there's some stickers on the way to you my friend I don't really quite know what to say just that yeah anytime you want to come up and have a ride with us you're more than welcome anytime and then uh and then he said, yeah, if you ever want to ride with us, let us know. But anyway, I decided to call him, ask him if I could call him. Then I went up and met him and all the rest of it. And then we started talking about this America tour. And I said, well, I always wanted to do Route 66 with Rick. And we said, out of my retirement, I'd pay for us both to do it. So would you and Ricky never ever made plans we, we to do the routes about it? We talked about it. We talked about it. We never so it was the dream? Yeah, it was but, the dream. Yeah. I mean, nothing solid, but it was the dream to one day, let's just go and do Route 66, just me and you. Because I've still got the... I've kept all these texts and everything yeah, yeah. from before. And uh, when he said about my VFR, he's getting back into bikes again. He said, oh, come on, Dad, get, get another bike, get another bike. I need someone to ride with. I need to ride with my mentor, that's what he used to call me. And then my sensei, that he used to call me. And I said, no, no, Rick, I've got better things to spend my money on. I can't afford it. Self-employed, blah, blah, blah. He said, oh, please, please, please. So I went and got this bike in the end. He said, you'll love it. It's like an armchair. Be ideal for you, an old man's bike. That's when I bought the red VFR. So did, did Ricky find that Ricky bike? Ricky found the bike ah, for right, okay, yeah. yeah, he said, I found the perfect bike for you. Blah, blah. So he was always going on looking at different ones yeah. online and stuff like that. And he went to uh, Bikers World in Daventry, uh, which have been really helpful in the past. And supporters obviously gave yeah. Ricky's last ride. Um, so thanks to them for that. And uh, yeah, so he found this bike. So I went and got this bike, cut long story short. And we went out and I had a couple of rides with it. And we planned to go out and do a tour the following year. Yeah. Rick was Lee was going to pass his, his CVT and get his, do his direct access, get a bike free, yeah. going to go and do Europe. That was in the in the summer of the year we lost him, but it never happened, obviously, because then everyone said, please don't ride again. Lee's not going to ride again because we're going to want it happening again. We don't like him to strike twice. And um, and I thought long and hard about it, and I thought, no, he wouldn't want me to stop. I could hear him telling me, Dad, yeah. carry on, carry on. What about the blood bikes? What about what we was going to do? You need to do it, you know. And that's so how, how did that blood bikes, how did that come about? Rick was like a, I used to call him Walter Mitty. Yeah. Like he used to come up with all these stupid, fandangled ideas. And I used to say to him, really, maybe you should go back and think about that one, because that really doesn't sound right. And then, oh, right, okay then, the stupidest ideas. I haven't got an example to tell you, but, but, and then one day he said to me, and he, he, he was different when he said it this time, he said, Dad, I, I want to do something, I want to make a difference. He said, what do you mean? I said, I want to feel like I want to give something back. You know, I don't just want to amble through life being just a nobody and, and just take, take, take. I want to give something back. I said, well, what you got in mind? He said, I don't know yet. He said, but leave it with me, I'll work on it. A few weeks later, he came come back. He said, I might join the army. I said, why? He said, I don't know, because then I'll be giving something back and protecting people, blah, blah, blah. And I said, nah, that's not a good idea. Think of something else. I mean, I've got total respect for all the people that do that. I think he was going to do like the, the, the specials and that kind of thing. I said, is it really you? Are you really cut out for that? And he went, oh, okay. And he came back and he said, what about blood bites? I said, who are they? What are they? So he said to me, I'll look at this, show me the videos, all this, and talk to me about it. And I went, wow, that is, no, that is giving back. You know, there are people, anybody can give something, but to give up your time is the most precious thing. Yeah? Because we're not, not all of us have got time to give. Yeah. So when you do give it, it's something special. And I said, yeah, this is a good idea. Really good idea. I said, I'm up for that. I'm in with you. So... So we said, right, what we're going to do is start training. So I got in touch with um, one of the advanced biker people. Yep. And then um, there was Rosper at the time. And then I started training with Rosper. Yep. Um, with a guy called Nick Sweetman. Fantastic. So guy. what do you have to do? Do you have to, do you have to look at the training first or do you contact Blood Bike? And no, what you, what you can you can join if you want to as a fundraiser, that kind yeah, of yeah, thing. Yeah. But you can't actually go out on any operations yep. doing deliveries or anything yep. until you've been trained. And to do that, you need to pass your advanced motorcycle yep. course first. So the first thing you do is pass your advanced. Once you've done that, you do your GMP training, which is your basic stuff, yep. learning all about what you need to do, how to handle the products, that kind of thing. Yep. Then you learn the, the routes. In our case, we have a south route, a north route, and a central route, yeah, from all the hospitals and care homes we deliver yep. to. And then uh, once you've learned all that, then you can have the training on the actual bike itself, then you go out and start doing the, 
the deliveries. It's got all just on bikes, you're yep. getting cars as well. And four by fours. Because when the weather's bad, we use our own cars. Yep. And, uh, or we use the four by fours, that kind of thing. So I said, yeah, it's all right. So I started the training, contacted Blood Bikes, joined them. Uh, Rick was about to. He said, he said, I've got a bit more work to do. He, used to, he was an alarm engineer yeah. for ADT. And he was always, he worked 60, 80, 100 hours a week. He was always doing the overtime, always raking the money. Because at the time, he'd given up his rental house yeah. and was living with um, his mother and father-in-law uh, with the kids yeah. so they could save up to get a mortgage. Yeah. So, um, so he said, as soon as I've done these next couple of jobs, he said, I'll join. But he came out on a couple of training runs with us as well. And then, uh, obviously, then we lost him. So, in the November. So, they said, that's going to be an amazing, amazing moment. Yeah. The moment you get the, you get the budget, you get the bike. Everybody sees the bike. The bike is in action. What then? And they can all, they yeah. can all think, we help get yeah. that, you know? We've got a part of that. So, what will happen? Carry on. What right? will happen once you've achieved it? It's, is it something you've thought of that? I haven't thought a great deal of it because it's just. Sorry, I don't know. It's just been such a. I haven't thought of it a great deal because it's just been such a long journey, you know? I mean, this is taking years. Not, not weeks yeah, and months. It yeah, it's. Um, I mean, this, this, this dream was concepted in 2014. So we're moving into the fifth, sixth year now. And the actual. The funding has been going on for. That's part of all yeah. years now. So, yeah. I mean, you could you could do one or two ways. You could do one, it might give you closure. You might think, that's it, something's, so something's happened on. for me. At least we know he's out there yeah. still. Or yeah. would it go the opposite, that does it feel like I'm giving up on his memory? And I'll, I'll never, I'm, I don't think I'll ever feel like yeah. that. And I think he'll know that how hard I've worked for it, you know. And everybody else knows that. It goes without saying, doesn't it? But, um, I think I'd still like to carry on with Ricky's last ride and keep that memory alive and have the stickers out there on people's bikes. Yeah. I mean, like I said earlier when we was off camera about um, how important it is to know that my son is known all over the world. Yeah. I mean, he's not. I mean, he's not like Richard Burton or anybody, but he's like, you know, he's people know about him in Australia, America, Canada, Europe. So much he's saying that and thinking that. Do you think at the time if? Do you reckon Ricky would have got into motor vlogging? Absolutely. He had a, would he, he had have a loved it? Me. Oh, did he? Yeah, yeah he's, he's the one who started me off getting my first GoPro. He had a hero. Because you know, my imagination of what you've said is he'd have the big personality for all it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think he'd have done great vlog, great vlog, vlogs and that. So I think he'd have been awesome at it. Yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, so it's something I want to keep going, yeah. keeping his memory alive. And I love it that people have got their stickers out there. Yeah, yeah. Their stickers out there. And people that know my son, because he deserved to be known, you know, because he's a good boy. Yeah. You know? And he was, he was, the way I look at it now is, I don't know why, and maybe one day I'll find out, but it's, the big man, me and the big man upstairs and fell out for a long time, because I, I just couldn't, I didn't understand yeah, why. Yeah. Well, there's so many arseholes in yeah. the world, and he has to take one of his angels, but... I've come to the conclusion that he obviously needed him more than I did to go on and do better work somewhere else. And uh, maybe I'll find that out one day. Lot to look forward to this year, so I'm staying positive. The blood bike is the main main agenda. And uh, hopefully that's going to be all good. We'll have another good wild bag this year yeah, as well. Definitely. So, yeah, so staying positive. Getting that, uh, topping that glass up a bit more if I can. And then, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. An too. absolute pleasure. Absolute to talk pleasure. to you. Yeah. you too. I and think, I'm, like many of us, you know, I think we wish we all could take that pain away for you, but unfortunately, yes, it's something I have to deal with on a daily basis. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. do that. But I tell you what does it is the love that I feel. Not for me, the love that yeah. I feel for Ricky. You know, for people wanting to do this for Ricky. I oh, know they're trying to do it for me as well, because yeah. it's my dream as well and helped me succeed in fulfilling Ricky's dream. But for every single person that's out there, I mean, I can't, from the bottom of my heart, honestly, I can't thank each and every one. If I could thank each and every one of you personally, I would. But this, well, this is me doing it, saying thank you. Whoever watches this, whoever, whoever knows what it's all about, whoever's put their hand in their pocket multiple times or even once, a penny, a thousand pounds, what does it matter? At the end of the day, you've, you've invested in me and in Ricky and the future, the things that look after us like the blood bikes, you know? And this is what our biking community is all about and I can't thank you enough for that. And hopefully that comes across with everybody else. Mate, you know? yeah. I think we all, and I am, we all and I mean it. that most sincerely, you know? I, from 
bottom of my heart, I really do. I think that's the thing Ricky's done. He's dragged us all into it with him. And I think so, that's the key. That's sort of the, the, yeah, you know? I think that's the key. We all just dragged us all in. Yeah, one thing you could do is, is uh, keep, keep people together. And, and so I don't think of anybody I know what's come across and heard your story and have then just looked away and moved on. Everybody, they all, everyone seems to get drawn into that second. Like, what's the, what's that? Um, well, even now with the, with the website, the, the Ricky's Last Ride, yeah. the UK, I, I try and keep, once a month, I try and do a, a, a blog on there if I can, just to let people know what's happening, yeah. where we are, and anything that's coming up, tours and things like that. If people want to get involved, they can send me, send me pictures to put on, we can yeah. make it bigger, we can make it grow, and it'll never go away. And that, that memory is, even once we've got the bike, we still want to be raising money. I probably won't be asking people for it, but in my own right, I'll be going, I'll still be raising money for, yeah. for and spreading the word for blood bikes and stuff, yeah. Yeah. supporting them, which is good, keeping the dream alive, if you like, but also maybe become more of a, like what you guys do and, and what Richie does, just be kind of, spread it more to Albie's sort of channel. I mean, I only have yeah. a few yeah. videos yeah, and, 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 and stay in touch with people and what's going on in my life that way. Because I just love being out there with everybody because yeah. the camaraderie and the love and support is it's what keeps you going. I say when I come across Richie, it's almost like it was meant to be. You know, like I, say, I think you do, then I think you find connections with people. Yeah. And I think I think you know when you've made that connection well, with that's somebody. Because it's... Of him, the concept was 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 born, if you like. Was, we we when we first like going back when we said I discovered him, watching his videos in a bar of all places and then getting in touch with him and then meeting him and then talking about America tour, do you want to come and cost me an arm and a leg? Well I said my missus she said, How much? <laughs> um, <laughs> But she said, listen, I'd never stop you doing what you need to do. You need yeah. to do that for closure, then you do it. And it hasn't given me closure, but it's helped, yeah. you know. And everything since then has just kind of naturally happened and snowballed, you know. And as I was at work, and I said to the mates I was working with at the time, contractors and that, I said, oh, we're doing this thing. We're going to go across some Ricky. Richie said, well, you come across some Ricky. Well, two birds and one stone. He said, well, we'll do it for Rick as yeah. well. Yeah, right. I took my mate and we come up with the concept of Ricky's Lodge, right? But it'll never be. The ironic no. thing is, it'll never be. Never be, will it? No. Because there, he's never going to have a lunch no. ride. Because all the time that I'm riding, and the wild badders, and, and the moat, yeah. and the moat and revers are out, and all the people out there that are riding, he's riding with us, yeah. you know? So. It'll be the, ride, the, the forever ride, <laughs> won't it? The ride will continue. Yeah, yeah, the ride will always continue. He'll never have a lunch ride. And he's up there in the sky now, yeah. riding. So, <laughs> so yeah. Steve Clark, Albin, my friend. It's been absolutely amazing. You too, man. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for giving up your time and taking it and investing it in me. Obviously, everything you guys have done and still do. Honestly, well, I cannot think you The work is by this man. Huh? He, he's, this there you go, mate. He's done another bit of. He's been doing his raffling. Yeah, yeah, but you ain't only done that in the rack. You ain't got a sticker. Yeah, got a proper sticker. I'll, I'll send you some over, mate. Oh, That's how much a proper sticker is going to cost you. <laughs> It's just for the for the for the for the record, it's just a, another little donation from the Mount Rebel guys. Absolute diamonds, honestly. We go through life. I don't want to sound like a philosopher or bore people to death, but we go through life and we, we cross paths with people for reasons we don't know. We have bad times in our life and we have good times. What we have to do is get through the bad times and embrace the good times. And it's with people like yourself that make everything worthwhile. And, and if I can give you some love and support in any way, you can take anything from me to like I take from you, then the world will be a better place. God bless you. Steve, love you, mate. God bless.